want to say that Derek, uh, Gordon Chung is now a professor at the University of Auckland. They must have offered him a shitload of money to make him come from Hong Kong. Because Hong Kong pays really good. But maybe he's sitting there in New Zealand going, gee, I'm glad I'm not in Hong Kong now where all there are all these protests and riots. <laughs> anyway, so it's kind of, yay, we're almost famous because Gordon Chung is, we're not worthy. <coughs> RNSCA is good to fact. Regression weights. Equivalent regression weights are indicated if the change in CFI is small, less than and not more than 0.01. So that's why you're going to report the CFI to three decimals. 0 0.963, 0 0.962, oh, 0 0.001, yay. Right? So you need the third decimal for the CFI if you're doing an invariance test. Now, the CFI in a complicated model will go, no, 0 0.83, 883, which you go, oh my god, that's a reject. But remember, the CFI doesn't like your complicated model, so you're only using it relatively to see how much change there is, not, is this an indication of a good model? You see the difference? Metric equivalent, less than 0.01. Scalar equivalent, less than 0.01. If one of these turns out not to be true, you have to have the courage to say it isn't true. Okay? Don't kid yourself because the step beyond scalar is... This difference could be 0.015. This difference to here could be 0 0.001. You can't go, oh, this was so small, it's further than this, so therefore it's equivalent. No. If this one says no, then that's the end of the argument. This is not true, but this is. All right? So, in Amos, again, this is a model in Amos. This is one of the things I like about Amos, is it does all the code writing for you. But fortunately, Levon is not difficult. Levon, in Amos, it'll go, look, this is variable 12, group 1. This is variable 12, group 2. This is, and the V stands for the residual relationship. This is the regression weight. This is regression weight A10, group 2. This is regression weight A10 group 1. So it's going to compare A10 with A10, A9 with A9, right? That's what it's doing. It's comparing like with like. It isn't going, is this the same as that? It's going, is this the same as that? All right? So don't get confused here. And so this is what Amos does behind the scenes when you do an invariance test, and it calculates all this, and it's what Levon's going to do behind the scenes I want you to see, mentally picture what it's doing behind the scenes. This is what RMSEA, this is Amos. Wow, really good. Change, 926 to 915. I'm sorry, that's 0.011. It's bigger than 0.01. Eh. Do not go any further. It's not invariant. And if you look at the chi-square, Amos provides the chi-square DEF fit statistics, and it says there was a change of 10, a change of 26, and the difference is 0 0.003. So <clears throat> we can say whatever this model was, it works the same, it looks the same, but the values are not the same. They differ by more than chance. Here's a confirmatory study that actually worked. I gave my teacher conceptions of assessment inventory that I developed in my PhD with New Zealand primary school student teachers, sorry. And then I gave it again quite a few years later, uh, probably five or six years later, to 400 secondary New Zealand teachers. So New Zealand teachers, New Zealand teachers, primary, secondary. So the question is really, are they from the same sample, the same population, or are they different somehow? 
The configurable invariance was 0.041 for RMS yay. Yay, good. The difference in regression weights was 0.006. Oh, great. The second order to the first order factors was 0.01. Da 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 da. Everything was argued to be equivalent. And when you look at the scores for the 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 factors, what you see, 573, 404, 2.4, 2.5, and the average is 2.36. And at the irrelevance level, it's 2.9 versus 2.9. So, of course, the F statistic is zero. For improvement, 4.10 to 4.02, not significant. For school accountability, 2.7 versus 2.6, they're the same. Student accountability, 3.5 versus 3.9, statistically significant. So that's, the model was invariant, but the means were not identical for one scale. The scale of assessment is to judge the quality of students we're learning. Primary school teachers are, no, they're little children, we love them and care for them. And the high school teacher's going, look, they have to pass qualifications. We better give them good signals as to whether they're fail, just pass, good pass, amazing pass. We have to be honest. So high school teachers, because of their environmental conditions and responsibilities, had a different score here, but the inventory worked the same way. That's what's important. Yes? But how do you regulate C5 for different uh, part of models? Because usually it is for total model. Ah. Uh, I ran the total model. I'm not interested in the factor by itself. Because it's the combined relationships that I'm interested in. And then once I create the scores, I want to know. Now that I know the model, the inventory works the same way, and the statistical model works the same way, now I want to know if the scores are the same. And all of them but one. Really no, I wonder don't. how you calculate uh, the change of CFI separately for regression weights for second order to first order factors and so oh, on. Oh, because uh, back when... Ah, this is from Amos. From Amos. So it sets it, so first it's going to say, let's compare all of these numbers with those numbers. Then let's compare these variances here. Let's going to compare these. So it systematically tests one parameter at a time. And it shows you that when you set it up. And we're going to see how to do it in on, which is different. And see, this is what it does. The measurement weights, the measurement intercepts, the structural weights, the structural intercepts. If they exist in the model. Structural means covariances, residuals, if, depending on what's in exists in the model. And in this model, you've got one, two, three, four, five factors correlated, and two groups. And so that's what Amos allows you to set up. And it says, here's the CFI for the unconstrained, okay? Here's the measurement uh, weights. The difference is 0.02, so the two groups are not the same. It looks the same, but it isn't, ain't the same. And so you now need to go figure out what the heck. And you stop at this step, right? Yeah, you, you say, this model is not invariant. But it is meaningful. The uh, non-invariance is meaningful. Because the groups are so different. Yeah. So uh, what you have to do then, if you find that two groups are not invariant, it must mean they come from different populations. So you have to look at the population for, that you sampled and to say, are these populations the same? Could you uh, make a conclusion that the subscales, two subscales, are invariant and the third subscale is not invariant because of uh, population differences? It's possible. Barbara Byrne calls that partial invariance, where this part is the same, but this part isn't. You decided to be um, I'm interested in the model as a whole. So the model as a whole is clearly not invariant. I suppose I could, let's just look at this scale, let's just look at this scale and see 
but I'm actually interested in how this scale it relates to the others. So I'm interested in a multivariate construct. Mm -hmm. You could be interested in a unidimensional construct, in which case you could run the same thing without all of these factors. And you could troubleshoot it by doing factor one first, factor two, factor three, factor four, factor five, to see which part of it, if it's just a part, is not invariant. But for the purposes of that article, uh, the, for us the differences in the populations were so large, we just said, no, come on, there's no point going any further. But if you, I really want to solve this problem, this is my PhD that's at stake, then you would do factor by factor by factor to see if you can isolate where it's really going wrong and where it's okay. The problem with that is if you find this factor is okay but none of the others are, then in terms of invariance, this is the only thing you would be able to talk about to compare the two groups, which is kind of limiting. It's a trade-off. You know, it's not that you're right and I'm wrong, or the other way around. It's just that. The purpose. For yeah. Example, if I'm looking for a questionnaire for research, I'm going to be interested in several subscales only. It's possible that a measurement model will be invariant, but not invariant in the structural relations. I already said that. This does not mean the model is inapplicable. If the theory and empirical research can explain the different relations in this structural equation model, the model is detecting real world differences. It doesn't necessarily mean I have a bad measurement. It could mean the world is different. And that's just as important as saying my measurement is perfect. Uh, the meter is a perfect measure because we agreed to use the meter, except in America, well in the United States, where they insist on using the old British model of imperial measures, and that caused one of the space program explosions because one group was building in metric and the other group was building in imperial, and when they brought the pieces together, they didn't fit. So, that's why having the same met metric is important, but if the world is different, then the measurement cannot be the same because humans aren't the same. It's not like we're measuring objects, we're measuring humans. And humans' conditions and human societies influence our measurements. So I've showed you this. I want to see it. So let me give you an example from this. This was the teacher conceptions of feedback. My student in Louisiana wanted to use it. And she said, well, feedback is feedback, isn't it? It's when you tell kids how to get better. I mean, you know, like everybody agrees on that level. But Louisiana uses assessments quite differently to New Zealand. Louisiana uses high consequence assessments to find out if it's a good school, not to find out if Jane is learning. So it's quite a different thing, whereas in New Zealand, we use assessments without punishments to guide teaching and learning because the government doesn't get the assessment, the school keeps the assessment. It's not a government mm -hmm. assessment. It's paid for by the government, but the school uses it, and the school keeps it, and in fact the teacher sees the answers, the results first. Quite a different world to Louisiana, maybe quite different to yours. So should, in these conditions, how people think about feedback be the same? Maybe not. So, how would you test? Find a model that works in both groups and test it for invariance, which is what we did. So we had these four big factors of purposes, these one, two, three, four types, and two miscellaneous constructs. So we had ten factors that we had in mind when we designed the questionnaire. And yesterday, remember I said, and then we went back to the design and tried to create the design, and we found nine out of the ten. These are the ten. This is, 
So if you have a plan, when you write your questionnaire, that's the plan you should test. And what we found, and this was the Louisiana model, this was the New Zealand model, they look very different. And then we did, we thought, oh God, how can we compare these people? What's wrong? So we put all the data, shook it in exploratory factor analysis, and came out with one, two, three, four, five correlated factors. Okay, there were more New Zealand teachers than Louisiana teachers, so you would have thought the New Zealand model would, the New Zealand teacher responses would color this more. But when we did the invariance test, <clears throat> so we took the seven factor model from Louisiana, that's this model, and we applied it to the, uh, which data set is this? Oh, okay, this is to the, um, it works kind of okay. Yes, yeah, so this would be the Louisiana data. And then we applied the, so this should say Louisiana data, New Zealand data, joint. So the Louisiana data, uh, we tried the Louisiana model, and it works. We tried the New Zealand model, this one, and it doesn't work. It was not admissible. Because, and you can see that's okay. This is terrible. And this is me, probably not. And you couldn't get the SRMR because it was missing data. It's one of the problems of Amos. If you have missing data, it doesn't give you the SRMR. Then we tried the New Zealand data, the New Zealand model, the Louisiana model. And the New Zealand model fits the New Zealand data pretty acceptably. But it didn't fit the Louisiana data. Then we took the joint model. Five factors, 826 people, and it looks pretty good. But when we separated it into Louisiana and New Zealand, you think, well, it says model inadmissible. Model inadmissible. So the model was inadmissible. So the MA is, says the model is inadmissible. That's what the star means. So although the model was developed from the same data together, as soon as you pull it apart into the two groups, it works for one group but not the other group. So even a joint exploratory factor analysis that has OK fit, as soon as you separate it, you find out it really only works for one group, not the other group. These two groups are not from the same population. Because we were curious. We wanted to know what was going on, what was different. So we should not have done this, but we did it for pedagogical purposes. And we looked at the scale reliabilities. I didn't know about McDonald's Oh my good then, so these are alpha values. 47 versus 83. Wow, it's pretty good there. Yeah. 62, 76. You could, oh, okay, that one's okay. 69, 76, okay. 61, 56, okay. Too bad. 15 <laughs> and 45. So the, the coherence of the scale is really different depending on who you're dealing with. So even though the model worked okay for everybody together. So these three are probably, there might be some partial invariance here. Then you look at the mean scores, three versus five. Here's the effect size of the difference in mean, 2.3 and 1.13. So on two of the scales, they're hugely different in mean response, where Teacher grading focus, absolutely in Louisiana. The long-term effect, not in Louisiana. They weren't interested in feedback for the long-term effect. No, it's about passing the next test so I keep my job. Whereas New Zealand, well, we actually were interested in long-term. And then we looked at the interpolations between these factors separated by group. 
And the stars show you that the difference to the matched scale is hugely statistically significant. 24 versus 99, 25, positive 25 minus, compared to minus 34. It's almost zero compared to 77. Seven, negative 17 compared to 92. So even if it had worked, this is a hugely different set of scales. They behave completely differently, which is why the model really doesn't work. And when you see scales of correlations, 99, that these two scales are almost identical in one group, but they are very weakly correlated in the other group, of course this instrument is not behaving in a stable, reliable way. So the lack of invariance is sensible. So, normally you wouldn't even report this if you had found the model is inadmissible for the other group. You just wouldn't do that, but we did it just to show what was going on. So, every correlation was statistically significantly different. Mean scores were very largely different for one, two, three scales. And the scale reliabilities were hugely different for two scales. Conclusion, these scales are different for these two groups. Don't try to make them the same. <laughs> they are different. Um, yes, of course. For a PhD dissertation, in case you find that the two samples are different than you expect, would you add these uh, statistics to, to show how you get uh, deeper into the, the matter, or would you just stick to the general model? In a research article, you'd have, or a thesis, you'd have to explain. Well, the, the difference is not just that they're different, but that that was inadmissible for the New Zealand model. So you shouldn't do that if it's inadmissible. If it's admissible but not invariant, then this explains why it's not invariant. But here it says, inadmissible, this model is wrong. Even though these 500 teachers were used to create the model. So, be careful. If it's admissible, but not invariant, this is very informative. We shouldn't have done it because the model was inadmissible for that group. But it might be you could use these three scales, throw away the other two, and rerun it with just those three, and maybe there would be some, it would be admissible, but then you're throwing away a lot of information. And that's the challenge. I have to keep just these three, so I would lose three items, four, five, six, seven, eight items. So, if you're going to go down the line of partial equivalence, you could lose a lot of intended information. And then you have to explain, yes, I got an invariant solution, but look at all the stuff I had to throw away to get there. And people will be going, but, but, but what about that important stuff that you said in your theory before you designed your questionnaire that this was important and now you've had to throw it away? What? People will... Hmm. <clears throat> what is the benefit of multi-group confirmatory factor analysis? Well, in this case, it encourages the researcher to not believe that this instrument behaves the same way in both conditions. So it helps you to avoid the trap of using that inventory in my society. So it helps you avoid making a serious logical error. And it's highly likely that theoretical and conceptual framework of an externally developed research tool won't fit. So if you were interested in what teachers think about assessment in your country, then you could look at what Brown wrote and go, well, actually, some of this is the same, but, gee, assessment's different in our country, and maybe we should do an exploratory, interpretive study first and see if there's some ideas that we should add to the model before we even go out. 
And in fact, that's what my colleagues and I in Hong Kong did. In the three years I spent in Hong Kong, we did a major study on developing a Chinese student conceptions of assessment and a Chinese teacher conceptions of assessment. And we validated them with large samples. And that study said, well, some of these things cross over. But there are new things here. And they did some exploratory work. And they debated and discussed and talked to teachers and did some pilot work and came up with a whole new set of inventories which related in a whole new structural equation model for describes, describing Hong Kong and Chinese teachers' conceptions of assessment. So, if you just relied on the scale reliabilities for each factor, you might have accepted the Louisiana data. Yeah, good, okay, good, good. Well, yeah, maybe you would have gone with that. But you certainly couldn't have gone with it in New Zealand. Uh, Reliance on the overall fit of Model 3 would have said, hey, this works equally well. So this, this says 24, 3.66, I can live with that, 94, good, oh yeah, that's okay, that's okay. You would have said, that model is good. Now, let's compare New Zealand and Louisiana, but that would have been a big mistake. The invariance test says, no, no, it doesn't work. The second study I want to talk about is a study that I did, well, I helped Mustafa Asil do. Um, Mustafa was looking at 28 PISA reading literacy items from the 2009 Booklet 11. Booklet 11 was administered in 55 countries in 2009. And we looked at different factor models. We looked at, it's all one factor because reading is reading. But then we looked at well, actually, booklet 11 is testlet 1, testlet 2, testlet 3, and so on. We tested that model. We tested the model because uh, PISA says that I, some items are about extracting information and other items are about inferential processes. We tested that model. The best model that, the simplest model was the one that was admissible everywhere. So we had one factor. The multiple choice items were scored 0, 1. The politicized items were scored 0, 2. Access, these three reading processes were measured. We tested that. It wasn't as good as the one factor model. And uh, we had 32,000 cases from 55 countries. And we reduced it to a random sample of 500 from each country to make sure that sample size wasn't affecting or distorting. And we compared Australia, because the Australian Council for Educational Research was responsible for the operational development of a uh, PISA 2009. So we thought, well, let's make Australia the reference point. The problem is that when you do so many comparisons with such large samples, with so many items, by chance, small differences will be statistically significant. And you would be over-interpreting the difference. 500 times compared to 500, there's 1,000. It's how many items? It's 28 items in one factor. So you've got 28 parameters and 28 parameters and 500 and 500. So the probability of a tiny difference being statistically significant is not zero. So when you estimate these probability curves simultaneously, you tend to get higher type 1 error rates. And you might get non-invariance that in the real world no one would care about. The difference is so small, a man on a galloping horse would not notice it. Okay? So, Fritz Drasgo, we're not worthy, and his student, Christopher, I think his name is, Nye, developed a measure called DMAX. So it's an effect size like, organized like a standardized effect size that measures the magnitude of 
non-invariance in uh, scalar and metric simultaneously. So it'll give you an effect size. Is it big? It might be statistically significant, but is it big? And for a while there, they had open access. I don't know what's happened to it. The DMAX computer program, that they had it online, and I can't find it online anymore, but I downloaded it, so I have it. But where is it now? I don't know. Maybe there's packaging to sell it with 